viral videos of a de-aged Tom Cruise and other celebrities have been going viral. They're masterminded by a London-based company developing AI for hyper-real virtual experiences in the metaverse. Please welcome Metaphysic founder Tom Graham to the show. Tom, thanks for joining us. So let's put a video of these deepfakes on the screen here. Your tech has been used for Tom Cruise deepfakes on social media ads and even a stint on America's Got Talent where uh, Metaphysic introduced hyperreal generative AI content to a national TV audience. What is the ultimate end goal of this? Do you see this going mainstream? Um, so I think that generative AI, and this is really what it what we do as part of um, is already, you know, on its way to becoming very mainstream. Uh, at Metaphysic, we create the infrastructure and the technology to scale hyperreal content. So it's generated by AI, but it looks exactly like the real world to scale that in an ethical, safe and responsible way to millions of people across the internet. And so today, I think what you see from <clears throat> ChatGPT and stable diffusion, et cetera, um, are the first steps towards that journey. All right, so uh, you metaphysic the ethical is... aspect of it. Um, how, do you, well, how does that, can you just break that down? Because that's a real question that's been um, coming up. Like, how, how do you preserve the ethics of something like this, which clearly, you know, has a lot of danger to ha of, of using, being used in an unethical way? Yeah, I think the central point is consent. So individual people, if they are having a version of them created by AI that looks exactly like them or sounds exactly like them. Individual people should be able to consent to how it is used or whether it's used in the first place. Um, and that comes down to being able to control the data, my biometric data around my voice, my face, etc., that's used to train and create these models that creates this synthetic output. So yeah, ethics are really central to what we do. Um, and I think that consent is the center point of it. So with those Tom Cruise deepfakes, he was he consented to them because I got to say when I first saw them, I was, you know, feeling a mix of shock and, you know, uh, just r really amused and entertained, but then also very cognizant of how dangerous it could be if it could just be applied to anyone and, uh, you know, for nefarious purposes. Yeah, so Deep Tom Cruise, which became a huge viral sensation on TikTok, actually started as an art project before Metaphysic was even founded. It was started by my co-founder, Chris Ume, and the director, writer, a performer, Miles Fisher, who plays the underlying Tom Cruise character. Uh, and it was begun um, with the purpose of generating awareness for manipulated media and the potential for what could happen. Um, obviously, Deep Tom Cruise is kind of irreverent, fun, entertaining content. When it suddenly blew up, we contacted Tom Cruise's team um, and ultimately they didn't have an issue. So six years ago, Rogue One came out and you had uh, Grand Moff <coughs> Tarkin as a, uh, you know, it was a, basically it was like one of the first major deep fakes, if you will, uh, <coughs> on, on screen. I, I assume the costs have gone down tremendously. Uh, what what will this mean for Hollywood, for the for the makeup artists, but also um, what will it mean in general in terms of costs for some of the uh, some of these more elaborate avatars of the world? Uh, do you, do you think that it will substantially reduce costs? So um, I think that. I'm not aware uh, of a really significant use of um, kind of pure play AI in the terms of synthetic media or a face replacement or a deep fake, as it were, um, that is really central to the storytelling of a Hollywood movie until, you know, today with the announcement of Metaphysic working on the Tom Hanks, Bob Zemeckis movie here. Um, in the case of the Star Wars movie or other kind of digital characters that you've seen, generally they are 3D generated CGI. Um, and it really hasn't been possible to create them fully with AI, as it were, without 3D models underneath, et cetera, until about now. So that's a big step change in terms of the technology which is used to create this synthetic content. It also means that you get to move away from some of the very, very compute intensive costs um, involved with traditional VFX, CGI, 3D modeling. And so I would say that to answer your question, 
AI generated content in the sense that we do it um, is probably uh, 10 to 50% depending on, depending on the complexity of the shots, uh, more cost effective than traditional methods for really so, high quality content. And obviously this also translates into the biggest entertainment of all which video games, right? It, it, do you see this uh, being applied in video games yet? Um, or do you see the potential, any, any upcoming projects? Uh, of course, because uh, gaming is, is eating Hollywood's breakfast now. Yeah, so really what we're talking about with the, the ability to create quickly, super personalized, hyper-realistic, immersive content is it goes beyond entertainment, video games. It's really the be-all and end-all of the internet for the next 10 years because we would be doing this interview in a virtual environment, which is rendered out perfectly hyper-realistically, and realistic avatars of ourselves would be sitting around talking. And so when you think about e-commerce, work, education, going to the doctor, parent-teacher interviews, everything that we do that involves human interaction is better experienced through a experience that looks just kind of like real life, feels like real life, is emotionally just as engaging as real life. So this technology is going to be widespread uh, and will impact every facet of our lives going forward. So I just want to turn back to Tom Cruise for a moment because, you know, you rightly emphasize this question of consent. But if I understood correctly, it sounds like that was already out in the world. It went viral. And then you went to Tom Cruise's team, right? So, I mean, you could argue that at that point, if he had had a problem with it, it would have been already too late, unless I'm misunderstanding something. So I'm just curious, is that is that the best way to go about this? So... In Western liberal societies, free speech um, and parody, etc., laws that govern the ability to create content um, cover many different uses uh, of people's likeness, etc., to create content. And where that kind of impacts people, that's where you know those laws around fair use, parody, etc., impersonation butt up against, you know, individual rights. And so uh, there are many, there's a long history of parody, commentary, um, et cetera, in our society. And many deep fakers were creating irreverent, joyful content for many years before Deep Tom Cruise popped up. It just so happened that the technology behind Deep Tom Cruise was sufficiently advanced to generate an output which looked very realistic. And it was really the first time in history that that happened. And it happened to become very viral. And so um, the consequence of that was that um, we reached out immediately um, to see if they wanted to take control of this, et cetera, um, or for it to stop or end. And um, that was not the case. So yeah, just, you know, not to linger too much on this whole Tom Cruise question, but just because this has such large implications for the world, um, you know, but again, the question of consent, it's like once something is out in the world and once it's already viral, it's a little late to ask for consent at that point, right? Because I mean, even if he had said like, I hate this, I want this off the internet, like what, what, what could he have done about it? So I'm just, I just, I think it's a really important question because you're right. There's a lot of tensions here, you know, between free speech and consent and just like, how do you manage that going forward? So I think the central thing that we have to do as a society is find positive economies, um, protocols, mechanisms for individuals to own and control their own data around their face and their voice, et cetera, their likeness. Because today you can't copyright your likeness. Um, you may be able to copyright a digital version of yourself, but the underlying data, you should own and control that in a way where you exert those property rights against people who might want to use it um, for any particular purpose which may not align with you and your consent. And so um, there are various legal mechanisms that people can use to get things taken down. Um, and normally they run most kind of um, vigorously with property rights. So I think finding a way for individual people to own and control who they are is and should be our central purpose as a group of people, technologists, as society, the regulators, et cetera, that we work with to for safe passage for regular people through what is coming in terms of this technology in the future. So is this where blockchain technology can come in, creating rights to digital identity and uh, creating ownership over that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, of all the technologies, um, distributed systems that help individuals manage their own identity, but importantly, 
um, create provenance um, around the data used in terms of ownership, where it's come from, how it was recorded, um, that data used to create the AI models. That's a really important, um, I think, step in the process of empowering individuals to be in control of who they are in this, you know, emerging hyperreal metaverse. Yeah, it's a really interesting question, because on the one hand, you can sort of see the like blockchain fixes it argument here just about like owning data. On the other hand, though, you know, it, when it comes to taking down content, blockchain technology makes it a little bit more complicated, right? Because like the whole point of blockchain is that it's immutable and you can't take things down easily. So it's just an interesting tension, like, you know, how that how, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I don't have the answer to that, but I think that's, you know, it could definitely cut both ways. So I think that when content makes it out through big distribution channels, um, particularly in the US to a lesser degree in other places around the world, those platforms have a responsibility to moderate that content, especially around, you know, copyright infringement, etc. So getting something taken down, there are legal avenues which exist to do that today. They're not necessarily um, fully automated or designed for billions of people worth of scale, but they are legal frameworks, um, which provide an avenue for us to expand into a space where regular people can actually meaningfully get something taken down from the major distribution channels where it may reside or may have been posted. Um, there are, it's a rapidly developing area um, and at Metaphysic we really are at the forefront of trying to noodle out how to let people protect themselves in this emerging future. How many more months before we see a politician say, that wasn't me, that was a deep fake? Uh, that happens all the time for the last couple of years. Um, the concept of uh, a politician using what is known as the liar's dividend, where because the idea that anything could be faked, they might say that something is real, was in fact deep faked. Um, that happens frequently. And so that's a very disturbing trend. Um, I think that everybody should be aware of the concept of the liar's dividend, which often enables people in totalitarian or autocratic regimes to um, exert further control over the media or information as it moves around the public. In places where speech is less free, it is a large issue. Um, I think though, really, the larger issue as we move forward is around what happens with regular people and regular people's activity, because politicians have um, all of the internet to help verify what they are doing, et cetera. Celebrities have lawyers, but what about regular people? What are the mechanisms that we can use to protect ourselves? That at massive scale, you know, in terms of AI generated content writ large across the internet has the potential to impact our society in ways which I think when we look at the impact of social media is only just scratching the surface. All right, I guess that's what scares me because as a normal person, what if my image was taken out there and a deep fake was used to have me saying something I never said and there's, you know, my word against the rest of the world going viral. Like, what do you do in that situation? So um, that is genuinely a concerning thing that is happening. And when you look at today, some of the, um, models that are out there around stable diffusion, you can plot a course where um, it's not terribly difficult to take a regular person and create a synthetic version of them that looks realistic um, or have a synthetic version of their voice, etc. So I think that it's really up to regular people, um, technologists, regulators, um, everybody involved in thinking about this technology and how it should be rolled out to take a long concerted look at how we do it and to think responsibly about the ways in which technology can impact not society as a whole, but regular individual people. Wow. Got your work wow. cut out ahead of you, Tom. <laughs> a lot of ethical privacy, but incredibly interesting technological developments. It'll work ahead out of you. okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was Metaphysic founder Tom Graham.